All right, it's time for another reading vlog. And let's kick things off with two very different but very good vampire books. First up we have Vittorio the Vampire by Anne Rice. This is one of Anne Rice's Tales of the New Vampires, following on from Pandora, which I reviewed recently on the channel. This is the second book in that very short-lived series. Basically, in the Tale of the New Vampires, Rice focuses on either characters that are very small characters in the main Vampire Chronicles series, or new vampires altogether. And with Vittorio, we get a completely new character, a completely new storyline, and I would say a bit of a breath of fresh air injected into the series. I've actually seen reviews for Vittorio and Pandora online, and I've found that people actually tend to prefer Pandora, but at least so far, I'm much more preferring Vittorio. Now, I'm only 30% of the way through, so I can't uh, say that my opinion's gonna stay the same, but what I can say is, I think the reason why I'm enjoying Vittorio the Vampire a little bit more than Pandora is because it's actually a completely new story with a completely new character. And what that means is, Rice is having to do a little bit more work than I think she was doing in Pandora to actually tell a full, fleshed out story. I felt like with Pandora, she was relying a lot on the intrigue around Pandora, because we already know her from the Vampire Chronicles, and she was just kind of relying on that too much, and wasn't really telling an interesting story in its own right. Whereas with Vittorio, at least so far, it seems like we're getting a very fresh and interesting story. So I'm looking forward to seeing where this one goes. I haven't got all that far into it, like I said, I think I'm just about 30% of the way through, but I'm enjoying it so far and I'm looking forward to seeing how that one goes and I'll certainly be reviewing it on the channel very soon. Next up is another big vampire book, Bram Stoker's Dracula. I absolutely adore this book. It's one of the best vampire books ever written in my view and it's one of my favorite novels of all time. I first read this book way back in school and I loved it then, although I did find it a bit of a slog to get through, and reading it now I appreciate it all the more, and I think it's just a fantastic book. And I'm really looking forward to digging deeper into the book in my Reader's Guide series, which should be coming out very soon. I'm hoping to get the Reader's Guide out by Halloween, if not before, so be on the lookout for, for the Dracula series then. I think what I like most about Dracula is the way Stoker just really takes his time to develop and build atmosphere and tension. This is especially true in the first four chapters, which to me, to be honest, if Dracula was just those first four chapters, it would still be a classic. So in these chapters, you have Jonathan Harker arriving in Transylvania and being a very, you know, confident, you know, rational English man looking at uh, Transylvania and being a bit judgmental about these uh, primitive people, as he might call them. But then slowly as he goes on this journey, by the end of the first chapter, he's getting a bit intimidated by the nature around him. You know, first he thinks like a typical tourist, oh, wonderful landscapes and all that. But then he starts to become intimidated by these mountains, especially as it gets dark and he starts to hear the noises of wolves and it all gets a bit creepy. And then in the second chapter, he arrives at Castle Dracula. And, you know, again, at first he's sort of awed by Dracula and this castle and feels somewhat safe from the outside world. But then by the end of this chapter, he then realizes he's a prisoner in the castle. And then in the third chapter, you have this buildup of tension even more when Harker realizes that Dracula is a threat to him and we have the scene with the brides closing in on him. And then by the end of the fourth chapter, everything is completely lost. Jonathan's fate is left in the balance and then we move on to the storyline with Mina and the other characters. I just think that this way of slowly crafting tension is perfect. And I was really enjoying reading this for my reader's guide because I was making notes on it and just noticing how detailed Stoker is in his writing and how much time he really spends developing tension and repeating words and phrases to make you really feel like this character is in danger. So yeah, I think Dracula is a great book and yes, it, it's long and, and, I, and I, will, I will admit that in some places it's a bit bloated, but I still think it's a wonderful story and I'm looking forward to talking about it in a lot more depth in my reader's guides very soon. Okay, moving away from the vampires and getting grounded into a bit more reality. Next up we have Death in Venice and Other Short Stories by Thomas Mann. So I did mention this in the 50 Books in My Room video quite recently. This is a book of short stories by Thomas Mann, as the name of the book suggests. But the big story is Death in Venice, and this is the story that I read this month and was also the last story in the book. So I've now finished the short stories. It's a pretty good story, I did enjoy it. And I wasn't expecting it to have a pandemic-oriented storyline. Essentially, Death in Venice is about a novelist who goes to Venice and he sees this very attractive young man and becomes kind of obsessed with him. Meanwhile, there's a pandemic going on in Venice, a mysterious illness that's killing people, and he chooses to remain in Venice just so he can check out this boy who he fancies rather than, you know, get out there and save his neck. It's a pretty enjoyable story. And I've noticed that Mann seems to have this recurring theme of kind of 
the deathliness in beauty. So basically, a character will often die because they're pursuing something beautiful, which is certainly the case in Death in Venice, but also in some of his other short stories. And I think he does the theme pretty well, and it's a theme that I really do like, because I think, you know, there is danger in beauty if you become too attracted to whether it's a person or art in general, it can, you know, can lead you to some dark places, and so I enjoy it when authors explore those themes. One thing that I would say though is that even with Death in Venice and some of the other short stories, I do think that Mann is a little bit overblown in his prose, and I think this could just be a translation issue. Obviously the originals are in German, so I don't know if he's more concise in German than he is in the translation, but I did find that the translation was just a little bit bloated in places, a little bit overwritten, especially because these are short stories as well, so I wasn't expecting to feel the length of these stories because they're quite short, but I, I did, did sometimes. So I would say that that was a bit airy that lacked for me, but nevertheless I do think that Mann writes very well, he's very witty and really funny uh, in places as well, so definitely worth checking out if you haven't read this collection, and Death in Venice is a significant highlight too. Next up we have something that I'm surprised that I came back to so soon, we have more Marquis de Sade, this time a lesser known and very short work, and that's probably why I read it, uh, a dialogue between a priest and a dying man. So this is a really short work, I think it's about 20 pages, which as I said is probably why I decided to just have a little read and see what it was all about. Because I am sort of just constantly drawn back to Saad at the minute, even if probably his longer stuff I'm going to have to leave for a while. But I was interested to see what he actually does in the span of 20 pages, because usually he's quite bloated. You know, he certainly was with Juliet, you know, 1,200 pages. So it was interesting to see what he could do in such a short space. So this work is a dialogue, and it basically summarises Sard's main arguments against religion, and he does it in a really nice way, it's much more concise than his anti-religious arguments in his bigger works where the, you know, the, pit, the rants can just go on and on and on. It's much more concise than that. Also, it's surprisingly, you know, it's got a lot of playfulness and fun into it as well. The kind of scenario is this, you've got this uh, man in prison who's about to be sentenced to death, the priest comes in, and I think it starts off with the a uh, priest saying, you know, you need to confess, and the, the the dying man is like, oh, I have so many regrets, and then the priest obviously thinks that he means he's regretting his sins, but actually, <laughs> because it's sad, the prisoner is actually regretting that he didn't do more terrible things before he was arrested. So that's typical sad stuff, and then at the end there's also a really funny twist with the priest and what happens later on, which I won't spoil in case you read it. I enjoyed this one, and I think if you haven't read any sad, it's not a bad thing to start with, it is very short, it's not got any of the more disgusting elements of Saad, it's much more just light and fun, and it does have, you know, one of his big anti-religious arguments in it. And, you know, even though you've probably heard a lot of these arguments before, it's very interesting to see someone who's willing to write this kind of atheism within the time that Saad was writing. Because even though in the time that Saad was writing, you did have your atheists, they often, you know, did kind of disguise their atheism in clever little ways, just to kind of, you know, keep themselves safe. So it's nice to see Saad coming up with these kinds of arguments that are really upfront in their atheism all the way back then. And you know, at 20 pages, it's sort of something that you can dip into and finish really quickly, so that's always good. And last but not least, we have a collection of poetry by Emily Dickinson, which I have nowhere near finished because it's massive, it's a collection of all of her work, and I'll probably be dipping in and out of this for a long time, but I thought I'd mention it on the channel because I've read quite a few of them, and I am definitely enjoying them. So if you've been on my channel for a while, you'll probably know that I don't tend to talk about poetry and that I don't really read poetry, but recently I've been trying to get into poetry a bit, and I'm actually finding that I like it a lot more than I used to like it when I was in school. And I'm really enjoying Dickinson's poetry. So I wasn't expecting to really like Dickinson's poetry all that much, mainly because the poetry that I have been reading in my, you know, very, very beginning steps, baby steps into poetry, have been narrative poems like The Fairy Queen and Child Harold's Pilgrimage and all that kind of stuff. And the reason why I've done narrative poems is because I like, you know, stories, clearly. Um, and so it's much easier for me to get into a narrative poem, whereas obviously Dickinson's poetry is a lot shorter and a lot more symbolic and cryptic in some cases as well. So I wasn't expecting to like it, but actually I, I really do like it. And sometimes it's not even so much that I know what on earth she's talking about in a poem, it's just the way that the poem sounds when you read it out loud, because of the way she uses punctuation, very different rhythms, and also just the way sometimes she puts words together just feel really nice to say. 
And that being said, it's not like all of her poems are completely abstract and strange. A lot of them, they are pretty understandable too, and there are lots of different themes that I really enjoy. And they actually show her to be a much more multifaceted personality than kind of her image of, as this sort of, you know, austere, reclusive woman. Actually, she's got a very wicked and dark sense of humour in some of her poems, and she certainly seemed to have ambitions. There was a poem that I read very recently that seemed to be kind of suggesting that she doesn't care that people don't like her poetry because she knows that in kind of the fullness of time uh, her poetry will be recognised, which is something that turned out to be true. So there's lots of interesting stuff in there, there's lots of interesting themes, and I would definitely recommend if you don't read poetry all that much and you want to dip your toes into something, Dickinson isn't a bad place to start. I think as well with poetry, I think one of the reasons why I didn't like it so much growing up is because the only time I read poetry was in school. And when you do poetry in school, and also this applies to classic novels too, you know, your aim isn't really to enjoy the story or the poem, it's to analyse it. And so what you do when you're reading the novel or the poem is you're kind of trying to always read between the lines and trying to work out, you know, what does this description mean? And what does this word mean? And why have they put them together on the page in this way? And you know, that is important uh, if you want to analyse a text. But I think the problem is when you start by doing that analysis, it's much harder to just sit back and take in the poem or the novel. And I found that with Dickinson's poetry, I've just been kind of reading them uh, reasonably fast and then kind of rereading the ones that I, you know, that stand out to me. And I'm not trying to understand them, I'm just kind of appreciating them. And I'm finding that this is a much more effective way to get me into poetry. And when you read them, you know, after you start to like it a bit, then the analysis comes after that. And I found that that has worked really well for me. So if you're someone who only did poetry in school like I did and didn't really like that kind of way of studying it, try poetry like that. Try just reading it, not expecting to understand it. And then if you like the way the words sound or you like a certain image, just go back to that poem again and read it again and again. And then slowly kind of, you know, themes and little things will come out. And so that, that's worked for me. So hopefully uh, if you're in the same boat as me, that might work for you too. I think I'll definitely come back to Dickinson in a later video once I've read some more of her poems. I think what I might do with poetry is maybe have a video where I pick 10 poems that I really enjoyed and then just talk about those particular poems rather than talking about kind of all of the poems because that's just way too many poems to talk about in a, you know, 10-15 minute video. All right, that's it for everything I've been reading this month. I look forward to discussing with you in the comments the things that I've read and the things that you've read. Take care everyone. I'll see you all in the next video. Ta-ra!